As I said, I'm Father Pat Beidelman, and I'll be your cruise director today. Welcome to this uh, confirmation in service. And I'm going to have the team who's going to present today on various aspects of the planning and the preparation for the celebration of con confirmation in the Archdiocese of Indianapolis in 2022. I'm going to have the team introduce themselves now as well. I'll begin with uh, the office manager from the Office of Worship, Christina Tooley. Could you say a bit about yourself? Hi, I'm Christina Tooley. Uh, as you said, I'm the office manager of the Office of Worship. I've been there a long time, 30 years. So some of you know me very well. And it is a pleasure to be doing this. We, as he said, we haven't done this for a long time. So um, I think it's just going to be a good refresher coming off of all of the craziness with COVID. Next, I'll invite uh, the Archbishop's Executive Assistant, Krista Bunch, to introduce herself as well. I am Krista. Um, I've been with the Archdiocese for eight years, um, half of that in human resources and the last half with Archbishop, and I do the scheduling of confirmation for Archbishop's calendar. Also from the Office of Worship, Andy Motika. Uh, you're still muted, Andy. Imagine that. Uh, I am Andy Motika. I am uh, the Director of Music for the Archdiocese and for the Cathedral. And I'll be helping us walk through some of the uh, specifics of music, both in the parishes and especially at the Cathedral Liturgies. From the Office of Youth Ministry, Paul C. Fuentes. Hello, everybody. As Father Pat said, my name is Paul C. Fuentes. I serve as a Director of Youth Ministry, uh, and we will be handling some, uh, giving you some information about uh, preparation for the sacrament of confirmation, the catechetical preparation. So, and I'm joined by uh, my colleague in the office here. His associate, Mary Kate. Hi everybody. I'm glad you guys are all here this afternoon. My name is Mary Kate Shanahan and I serve as our associate director of youth ministry with Paul. And from our office of catechesis, the great Ken O'Gorick. I do great on people. <clears throat> Sometimes, Great. but uh, Kevin Gorg, director of catechesis. Uh, yeah, part of my role is focus on on some aspects of sacramental prep that are that are more catechetical in nature. Uh, I also uh, help with the with sort of our internal process of those letters to the archbishop once they come to us. So so I'll be talking a little bit more about those letters. We will have some time throughout um, the the. Uh, the virtual meeting today for uh, you to ask questions and make comments, particularly um, at the end of each of the sections that uh, the, of, of the presentation. Uh, at that time, when uh, if you do uh, join us and you'd like to uh, you'd like to speak, uh, I'll invite you to raise your hand, and uh, I'll uh, I'll call on you based on the name that's on the screen. Uh, uh, on, on your video screen, oh, yes, screen. so I'll, I'll use that, uh, I'll use that as, as how I identify you, okay? And if you would, then identify yourself and tell us your role in the community in which you serve. Uh, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. From the celebration of confirmation, a prayer over the people that can be used at the end of Mass. Confirm, O oh God, what you have brought about in us, and preserve in the hearts of your faithful the gifts of the Holy Spirit. May they never be ashamed to confess Christ crucified before the world, and by devoted charity, may they ever fulfill his commands, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, thanks for being with us. And on behalf of Archbishop Thompson and all of us who are presenting to you today, we want to say thank you for your work in preparing uh, the young church for this, th this important sacrament uh, of, of discipleship and service. I want to thank you for just navigating all of the complexities of uh, what it takes to kind of call young people to uh, be intentional disciples and walking with them in, in the beautiful ways that you do, but all, also all the details related to uh, 
to getting to the celebration, preparing uh, what the Archbishop has asked for and what the church asks of us when we when we gather uh, for the celebration of the sacrament. So just know of our gratitude and, and I know Archbishop's gratitude. This sacrament is is so important to him and uh, we are very blessed to have uh, him in, in as, as our shepherd and to care so deeply about uh, this, this important part of his ministry and, and of course this important part of the church, the, the young people who are, who are candidates for confirmation. We're going to begin uh, with uh, a, a, also a very com a complex task um, or a, a complex part of this, um, the process of scheduling. Um, your contact for that is Krista Bunch and uh, the process that we follow, she's going to describe to us now. Krista? Hello. Well, the process was really set in place before I started. It was really quite a good process. Really, the only thing I think that we have changed since I took it over was the recurring date. Um, and that seems to have helped quite a bit. Um, back in, I think it was 2019, um, we gave the parishes options to select a date and if they wanted to use that as their recurring date for every year going forward. And that's helped quite a bit. If it's not the exact date, it's you know, we try to get it within the, the week or the day exactly, you know, each year. And sometimes that changes. And obviously, we'll probably say this 22 million times that COVID changed everything. Um, so some parishes end up just skipping a year or maybe doing another one closer to a year they hadn't done before, but it all hopefully work itself out. But I think it's that's been probably the best thing that's happened to our scheduling process is doing the recurring dates, but it's not set in stone by any means if somebody needs to change something. Um, I think Archbishop's biggest goal with confirmation is that he wants to attend all of them. Um, and I, from what I understand, if I can remember right, that wasn't always the practice of previous bishops, or maybe there were more than just him to do it. I can't quite remember, but it is his goal to try to get to every confirmation possible. So I really appreciate people working with me and trying to either combine masses um, combine dates or, you know, flexible with schedules and things like that, because I know it's not easy for parishes either. Um, the, the main thing, and when I asked this when in scheduling for the year before, I ask for your headcount, and then I usually do a follow-up, and Christina asks the same thing at some point, too, for headcounts. The, the main reason for headcount is that's, it's very important is, especially nowadays with COVID, and you're limited to groups and sizes, to know that a head count helps me with scheduling so I know how many parishes I can combine into one, you know, to try to minimize the number of masses that he has to do, given that he wants to attend all of them. So the head count is really important for me. It's not specific a head count that I need, but somewhere generally speaking, so that I can ensure that we've got um, the, the maximum capacity for each one. Um, as far as the times go, so the Indianapolis deaneries, they can obviously do them at the cathedral at seven o'clock on a Monday or a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, um, with meeting the candidates at six the hour before. For all the um, deaneries outside Indianapolis, oh, I'm sorry, going back to Indianapolis, or they can do it on a regular scheduled weekend parish or um, mass time. So if they want to do it at their own parish, it would have to be during a regularly scheduled mass on the weekend. Um, for deaneries outside Indianapolis, they are to be at 11 a.m. or 2 p.m. on a Saturday and at 2 p.m. or 5 p.m. on a Sunday, um, and that's Eastern Standard Time. Um, I know we've had to move these maybe a half hour or an hour or so one way or the other to accommodate being able to put two masses on one if there's some travel time in between, so I appreciate people's help with that too. Um, one thing that Archbishop and I used to really rely on were the mass times being published on our website. Um, and they're kind of revamping our website so that we have direct links to your parishes. So we always have the updated mass times. Um, but that's always helpful to know too when everyone's mass time is so that we're not either bumping into it or having conflicts with, with um, the outside deaneries. Uh, the pairing, I just wanna talk a minute about how I pair um, parishes. To me, the, the most important thing, like I said, is by the size. Um, then I also use the recurring date um, that the parish has chosen. For the uh, deaneries outside of Indianapolis, um, as I mentioned, I try to keep the masses to a minimum. I wanted to point out too, because I, I kind of was talking to Father Kucher about this the other day, and it made me think of something. For me, I want the dates to be what the parishes 
are are good with and that's good for them. The dates aren't so much as important to me as it is to the parish. What I kind of need help with is communicating, like if we have four or five parishes doing one mass, I just wanna make sure that it's good for all of them. Um, and if you can help me out with maybe distances or travel times between parishes, but I guess for what I'm trying to say is for the outside deaneries, I, they're more than welcome to tell me what date works best for them and I will work it into his calendar as best I can um, because we're trying to deal with multiple parishes and those particular confirmations. I need sort of like a group effort from the deans as well as the parishes to, to, to work those out. So, and I'll bet you, I would have to say probably 90% of the parishes chose a recurring date and 90% of those are all the Indianapolis deaneries. So the ones I'm kind of doing flex dates with are the outside deaneries. So um, I think that's all I had. If there's anything I might've missed, Father Pat, that you thought about. No, I think Krista, that's excellent. Obviously the process of scheduling confirmation has, has enhanced greatly, especially under Krista's leadership. Um, it, is, uh, it is, I think the best it's ever been. Um, with regard to trying to meet the needs of the parish and to be attentive to the demanding schedule of the Archbishop as well. So um, we do have some time for some questions or comments. Um, know that it's okay also to give positive comments. Uh, that's always good for us to hear as well, but we definitely wanna know where there are any gaps or deficiencies in what we're doing uh, or just anything that's not clear. If you wanna use your your raise hand function uh, in, uh, in the reactions uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, please do so. Um, and I'm just watching to see if we have any questions or comments. And if that isn't working for you, just jump in and I'll acknowledge you. Questions or comments? Uh, we have one comment, just- uh, Thanks, Elise. Uh, yeah, from Elise, thank you. Yes, Michelle Rosenbaum, please. Hi, I just wanna make sure we're already confirmed for our date on May 4th for Little Flower, is that right? Is that in your okay. handout? Um, no, it's it, it would be on my, uh, my calendar, but I will check and get back to you when we're done with this uh, call. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. And that's another thing. If you don't hear from me about a date, um, some parishes don't have kids that confirm every year, you know, because they're a smaller size or whatever. Um, so if for some reason you don't hear about me or from me, usually in late summer to early fall of the year, you know, like it'll be late, um, late summer, early fall this year, that I'll be scheduling for next year. If you haven't heard from me with a date by that time, feel free to reach out to me because I may have just accidentally overlooked you thinking you didn't have candidates for the next year. And like I said, some go every other year, but with COVID now, maybe that's throwing them off. So my calendar might be off too. Any other questions before we move on to our next topic? Wonderful. Thanks also for those who are using uh, the, uh, the the chat area to make comments or, or to uh, answer questions. I appreciate that. The next section that we'd like to discuss with you for a few minutes is the uh, catechetical preparation for the Sacrament of Confirmation. Uh, I'd like to invite Paul to... Uh, uh, to speak with us now about that. And then he and Mary Kate are both going to be available for questions and answers. Great. Thank you, Father Pat. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, I am really um, excited uh, that I get to talk with all of you about preparation for the sacrament. Um, just to get a little, little bit of background on me, um, you know, when I, I first came to the Archdiocese in 2007, I uh, worked at a parish uh, up in Geist, the uh, St. Simon the Apostle, and then I was at a parish in Zionsville, Indiana, just over the, the border um, in Dice Lafayette, Indiana. And so for about 10 years, I was over confirmation at one of those two parishes. And I could tell you that in those 10 years, I um, never figured out 
uh, how to prepare for confirmation. Uh, and I, and I use the quotes of figured out just because depending on your parish, depending on the individuals in front of you, um, there is not necessarily one specific way to prepare individuals for the sacrament of confirmation. Um, and you can see that a little bit in our archdiocese um, and the way in which we uh, are trying to guide and give tips, if you will, to prepare for confirmation. There, We don't have one way. We do have a, a confirmation preparation guideline. Mary Kate uh, was going to put that in the chat. If that's not something that you have uh, looked at recently, uh, it's been there. We've, we, we brought those in, I believe, in 2007. Um, and so they're still there. There's a link right there on the Office of Catechesis website. Um, and those guidelines are, I think, in some ways, beautiful that they, they give a lot of freedom um, and, and more direction and things to reflect on as you're preparing for confirmation. Um, that would be something that, you know, once again, we would affirm that, you know, you should always be looking at how you prepare individuals for the sacrament of confirmation um, and kind of refining and seeing what's working and what's not working in your, in your uh, parish environment. Um, so I, I wanted to today give you just a few different resources to, to look at. The first resource there is that the sacramental guidelines. And in the sacramental guidelines, they kind of talk about three, they don't kind of, they definitely talk about three different uh, kind of elements of preparation. First, they talk about remote. Uh, and that remote preparation is just kind of your normal catechesis, uh, catechesis that, that will hopefully is beginning um, with the parents at home uh, and then continuing perhaps in a formal way at, at a parish or continue formally at home or maybe at a, a, a parish school setting um, that aren't necessarily geared specifically towards the sacrament, but is in a way remotely parent preparing them for uh, the sacrament of confirmation. Uh, then after that, we, the the church talks about, um, now I'm losing my, my train of thought here. I don't want to call it the wrong thing. Um, uh, remote and then proximate uh, preparation. And that you, you begin to, um, you, you begin to get, get closer um, as you prepare for the sacrament of confirmation or really any sacrament, especially those sacraments of initiation. Um, but it, it, something to consider that at your, um, at your parish, uh, the proximate, pre pre proximate preparation doesn't necessarily have to be everyone together. Uh, depending on where people are, it could be different. If you got homeschool families, perhaps they're doing that proximate preparation for confirmation in their home. Uh, perhaps they're doing proximate confirmation at school. Perhaps they're doing it in a uh, RE program run by the parish. Um, then they, we move to immediate preparation. And those are really the, the final few weeks of preparation for the sacrament. And in that, that's really where I would encourage you as a parish to kind of come together, that everyone kind of comes together for that really immediate preparation for confirmation in those final weeks before, as Chris had kind of laid out, before you're scheduled for that uh, celebration of the sacrament. Um, a couple other documents that I would, I would refer to, and this is just because I'm a I love catechesis, um, is the Directory for Catechesis, great book um, that, that just came out not too long ago, um, would be a, a great book. And then a, a book that I think does a really good job uh, talking about some practicals uh, is the National Directory for Catechesis. And this one right here is going to, if you haven't seen it, many of you have already, and you could probably nod your head or shake your head, depending on <laughs> uh, where you are at the moment with the document. But um, it gives you some great ideas to think about and great questions uh, to ponder when you're talking about preparation for the sacrament of confirmation. Uh, so those would be two things I would tell you. Um, and then final thing, I would just uh, give you a little bit of thought to get, have you have a get, ask you to give a little bit of thought to is that when we're preparing for confirmation, um, there's no big test that they have to pass to receive the sacrament that hasn't come out yet. Um, not, not, and I don't think it's in the pipeline either. Um, you know, we really want to make sure that individuals know what the sacrament of confirmation is. That is key and probably be touching that in the, um, in the, uh, immediate preparation and that they want to be confirmed. They know what it is and they have a desire to be confirmed. Um, those are the two things that as we're preparing for confirmation, we really want to make sure we're, we're getting on sometimes. We try and do everything 
Um, and that kind of leads us to a few things I would say that those are little tips I'd give you. Here are things I'd, I'd say, don't do this. Okay. Um, just a few things. Um, don't act like this is the only time or the last time you're going to see these uh, young people as you're preparing for confirmation. Um, don't act like that. Um, even if, even if in your head, you're having those doubts and I've been there that maybe you think it's the last time. If you act like it, it, it sometimes you're going to create your own truth, <laughs> if you will. Uh, if you act like it, then they'll, they'll pick the, pick that up on you. If you kind of say like, well, you know, we really want to, this is going to be last time we're going to see you. So we really want to make sure you really understand these things. Well, it, it shouldn't be. This is a sacrament of initiation. Uh, and hopefully uh, I would think all of us would think that our parishes want to continue to have these young people in our community uh, after they receive, I don't think I'm going to get any debate on that one. Um, so that's one thing do, don't do. Um, don't, and I said this a little earlier, but don't think you have to have a one size fits all approach. Um, this is about journeying with people towards the sacrament of confirmation. And you're going to have different, you know, the parish is a community of communities. So you're going to have different communities within your parish, whether it's a school uh, community, those who are participating in RE, those who are, are, are homeschooled. And, you know, the more that you can walk with those individuals and in preparing for the sacrament of confirmation and, and through that, find ways to plug them into the life of the parish, I think that's going to be key. Um, uh, don't let confirmation be the only way that you reach young people. So if you, whatever, whatever age that you're, you're confirming um, or, or encouraging individuals to be confirmed, uh, please don't let that be the only way that you reach your young people. That the only way that they are reached when they're a freshman or a sophomore or an eighth grade is that they could prepare for the sacrament of confirmation. Uh, once again, we want to make sure that this is a part of the parish life. Um, the, the final don't, I would say, is don't ignore your parish charisms. And, and what I mean by that is, as that we're preparing these young people to, to receive the sacrament of confirmation and, and invite them into the and continually encourage them as we're initiating them, right? We're continually encouraging them to the life of the parish. Make sure that what, how you're preparing for confirmation reflects the parish charism, right? What does life look like at your parish? What does the regular weekly life of your parish look like? That should be incorporated into what, what, how you prepare these young people so that as they're preparing for confirmation, um, at, when they've received it, they have a, a, an idea of what it means to be fully initiated into the faith and into the parish. Um, so those would be the kind of some, some tips and some don'ts, if you will, uh, as you prepare for confirmation. So if anyone has any questions, Mary Kate and I can can tackle those, um, or you can just I can give you my address in the chat, and you can send your fan mail uh, to that address as well. Paul, could you go back and say the names of those book resources you suggested? I've got the directory of catechesis. Yeah, directory for catechesis. Boom. Directory for catechesis. And the national directory for catechesis okay. would be the one that has. I think this is would. I would say this had and and Ken being the. Uh, catechetical like guru the among other us. link so i've got the national directory from the usccb there but it's on amazon yep. and other places too yeah and it's on the it's on the uh catech uh the office our office of catechesis resource page uh there are a ton of resources on that page and the uh well the national directory and the general directory for catechesis are on those on those pages as well so we're very a lot of documents on there. making catechetical documents is all i can say Ken, uh, as we're talking about resources, is there anything you'd like to add just uh, to what uh, Mary Kate and Paul have said? Ken O'Gorick. Uh, I guess the only thing I would say is um, it's it's not required that you purchase a like a third uh, a third party resource to use with your young people. A, a lot of folks do. Um, we like print resources to come off of the conformity list that the USCCB maintains, but uh, but, you know, as Paul said, there's no, no one size fits all uh, approach and, and there's probably no one resource that's going to work in every situation. Uh, if all else fails, a Bible in one hand and a UCAT or a good catechism of some sort in the other. But but no, that's that's uh, I, I think that was a good overview of, of tips and, and some don'ts. Excellent. Thank you, Ken. Um, Father Pat, if I could yes, say one please. final thing, and, and Ken and I talked about this, um, mm -hmm. you know, I don't say, you know, 
keep looking at confirmation and do that by your, how you prepare for confirmation, do it by yourself. I, I think Ken or I um, would love to, if, if that's something you're looking at, if you're like, Hey, I would love to take a look at how we prepare our, our young people uh, for the sacrament of confirmation. I would love to, to come out or, or begin that conversation where we can begin to explore what it could look like and how our office could help you or what talents you have at the parish that could, that could change things a little bit. Uh, like I said, I have done this for many years and I have looked, I have tried a various, various ways to prepare young people for confirmation. So um, please, if that's something that, that may be uh, firing in your, the back of your head right now, please reach out. I'd, I'd love to continue that conversation and, and assist you in any way that I can. I know Ken's office would love to do that as well. Paul, I love your list of do's and don'ts. We need to form those into some thou shalls and thou shalt nots um, <laughs> and uh, get that uh, get that made into a t-shirt for the next uh, business days. Got it. Other, uh, other comments or questions uh, with regard to catechetical preparation, anything we've spoken about? Again, if you'd like to use the hand raise function, please do. Otherwise, rolling right along here, folks. Thank you so much. The next, uh, the next topic I'd like to, uh, to invite us to spend some time with are the letters to the Archbishop. As many of you know, uh, who've been many moons in this canoe, um, we... Um, this is something that Archbishop Thompson asked when he began his service as our Archbishop. And again, it's something that's very, very important to him. And um, we are uh, going to have, I believe, Ken O'Gorick talk about the content and format of the letters first. Uh, for those of you who are, for those of you who are um, using the, uh, the, a task resource that uh, Christina emailed to the group. Uh, there is a section on this in that document uh, on um, page five, uh, if you'd like to follow along with that. And let's see if Ken is available to begin his, his presentation. All right, folks. Um... My computer said my internet uh, connection is unstable, so hopefully I won't won't fade in and out too much. Um, I don't think it said I'm unstable, but but we'll we'll check on that. So hats off to all of you for being on this uh, on this meeting, and I know there are lots of folks who who just can't be here, but they're going to access the recording. So uh, so, so thanks a lot. Um, and super quick, I've been a confirmation small group leader at my own parish, St. Pius now for, I think, three or four years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I think Caitlin's even gonna, gonna let me do the catechesis for one, for one of the upcoming uh, confirmation for, uh, preparation sessions. So, so, so again, a lot of us here are involved one way or another in, in confirmation prep in, in real time. Um, so I, I'm gonna put a few thoughts on the table about the letters, the letters that uh, each, each uh, candidate writes to Archbishop Thompson and then, uh, as usual, we'll have time for some for some questions or some clarifications or anything of that nature. Um, there's an old saying that often it's not so much that we need to be taught so much as we need to be reminded. So, so hopefully, a lot of what I'll say will affirm kind of what you're already thinking and doing in, in your parish. But it, but it's a good idea to, to to affirm things once in a while as well. So, I guess one uh, overarching thought I would share about the letters is that they're they're a means to an end. The, the letters aren't an end in themselves, you know, you know, it's a very concrete thing, obviously, that we have to produce, uh, but they're meant to be the culmination of a, of a process. Um, so, so they're, they're, they're not, uh, they're not just something that Archbishop Thompson dreamed up as something for the kids to do. They're, they're, they're not an end in themselves. They really are a means to an end. Um, and as Paul was saying, uh, one of the one of the purposes the letters serve are it, it gives the candidates an opportunity to demonstrate that they have a good sense of what the sacrament of confirmation is and that they really do desire um, to celebrate this sacrament of initiation. So so uh, we, we want folks to celebrate sacraments knowingly and willingly. OK, um, so let's talk a little bit about how Archbishop Thompson uses these letters. As Krista said, he wants to be very involved in, in each and every parish's uh, experience of confirmation as much as he can. 
Um, so, uh, um, what Archbishop Thompson does is one way or another, he, he looks, he looks at the letters. Okay. Um, and he uses them not only to prepare the time that he spends with sponsors and candidates before mass, but, but as many of you are aware now, if you've, if you've been around, uh, uh him confirming folks for a while, uh, no two confirmation homilies are exactly alike, right? He wants to make the, the experience as, as personal and pastoral as he can. So he uses the letters to help him prepare uh, his homily so that, so that it, it really speaks directly uh, into the experience of your parish community and, and what some of these kids have, exper have experienced, you know, in their lives and in their process of preparing to celebrate this sacrament, okay? Um, so along those lines, um, the, the, the more you can do throughout your preparation process to, to help the kids really write a, a thoughtful letter, you know, one that, one that reflects um, the, 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 the preparatory process that they have gone through, uh, the more you can do uh, to, sort of, to sort of begin with that end of writing the letter in mind, uh, the more helpful it'll be in making the experience truly special, especially for the candidates, the sponsors, and, and parents. For example, um, uh, I can think of a parish or two that um, they they uh, they don't just have the the candidates write write letters in one shot. You know, they might have the candidates draft um, some thoughts, get some thoughts down on paper, journaling maybe during adoration, uh, and maybe not using the exact same questions that are in the letter, but 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 kind of rewording the questions a little bit to sort of get at some of those main points. Um, some parishes, uh, as a part of the uh, candidate sponsor sessions, they will have uh, the candidates and, and discuss at least some of the questions with their sponsors so that they're sort of hearing a little bit from their sponsor. What, is, what does confirmation mean to you? You know, tell me about your experience of confirmation. And similarly, some suggested topics for some dinner conversation or meal conversation at home, you know, getting the kids interacting with their parents. You know, who was, you know, what's your confirmation name, dad? Uh, why did you choose that saying, you know? Um, so all of these are little things that can be done long before uh, the final letter is written to kind of help help the, the, the process to be more meaningful. And, and I, I, I've used those words means and end. I, I, another way of putting it would be that, that the letter is, is a product that, that comes out of a process. And really uh, the more thought we can put into the process, um, the, the, the better the experience of writing the letter is gonna be more helpful it's going to be for all parties concerned. So super quick, um, some key things to keep in mind about the letters. Uh, first of all, it's a letter. It's supposed to be a letter, right? It's not supposed to be a, a form of, of some sort. Um, and I know we don't want confirmation prep to be like, like, like other experiences that the kids have that they might perceive negatively but it's okay for them to learn how to write a letter, right? You're, you're, you're doing them a great service actually by helping them know how to write a letter. And I think it's okay to say that to them. You know, you're gonna have to write letters of various sorts for the rest of your life. So, so this is what a letter looks like, okay? Related note, typed letters are awesome, okay? They, they, they're, just, they're just better, they, they, they help the process. So again, these young folks type things all the time, right? And again, we don't, we don't want it to feel like a term paper, but that's a great skill, right? To be able to type a letter. So typed is awesome, okay? Um, uh, if it has to be handwritten for some, for some truly compelling reason, then a nice dark pen is a beautiful thing, okay? Because uh, again, we're talking literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these letters passing through and getting put in binders and, and Archbishop Thompson having to read them. Um, along those lines, um, at least 30 days before your confirmation, you're gonna wanna do two things. First, you're gonna to wanna to email a PDF of the letters to Christina Tooley, okay? Uh, so, so that gets us what we need to start uh, our internal process, which I'll, which I'll mention a, a little bit more about in just a moment. And then only after you've emailed a PDF to Christina Tooley, should you also by postal mail get us the originals, okay? Um, so you don't you don't want to yeah you if you've if you've made a PDF and sent it that that gives you a backup copy or a backup file obviously of the letters um, I wasn't going to list any don'ts but I guess one don't I will say is for the love of God and all things holy 
don't send us your one and only copy of, of the letters in postal mail, okay? Because I can tell you, I don't know who Murphy is the patron saint of, but there have been several occasions where, you know, we don't have the letters and nobody else has them either because nobody made a copy or nobody made a PDF, okay? So, so don't, don't entrust your one and only hard copy of those letters to the, to the U.S. Postal Service. I love the U.S. Postal Service, but a lot of weird things can happen between Floyd's Knobs and, uh, you know, Marion County, okay? Um, wh when we get them, we guard them almost with our lives, but, but, uh, but you know, a lot can happen between, between that. Um, I, I would just say again, I mentioned it earlier, 30 days, 30 days before your confirmation date, that's, that's Either, either before that or by that time, that's when you should get it to us. And I know it's tempting with deadlines. You think, ah, they don't really mean that. You know, as long as, as long as Archbishop Thompson can grab the envelope on his way across the street to the cathedral, he can rip it open and kind of look at the letters and he's good. Trust me, that is not the case, okay? Um, between the volume of letters coming in, uh, 126 parishes, right? And, and, and his travel schedule at times, and Krista can attest to this, um, there's a process that we go through internally to help kind of tee things up to, to make it more easy for Archbishop Thompson. And then he does take the time, oftentimes several days in advance, uh, to prepare that pre-mass session and to prepare his homily. So 30 days really does mean 30 days. It doesn't mean, oh, as long as it's somewhere between three hours and three days, they'll figure it out, okay? Um, my wife tells me I'm not subtle. So if, if I'm being too subtle, let me know. Uh, but, but otherwise, uh, please take that to heart. Um, finally, uh, well, again, you can sort of work backwards, right? You got your confirmation date, you got 30 days prior to that, and then all those pro uh, experiences leading up to writing a thoughtful um, letter that's really gonna, gonna reflect a, um, a, 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 an enriching preparatory process. So um, I'd say uh, Chris, Christina Tooley is gonna talk about this in a, mo in a moment, but um, one other side benefit of writing the letter is it kind of helps prepare the, the, the candidates for that, that pre-session with Archbishop Thompson and their sponsors, okay? Because oftentimes he'll, he'll sort of interact with them and talk a little bit about some of what they, what they thought about and expressed in those letters. Uh, and then finally, just to reiterate what Paul said before we, before we get to some questions, um, truly, if you're looking for ideas, um, uh, if you want to, yeah, if, if you, if you want to use us as a sounding board, whether it's Paul or Mary Kate or myself, we would love to help and support you in any way we can on an individual basis. So please, uh, I always say we're not in the Catholic Witness Protection Program. We're easy to find. Um, reach out to us. We would love to be um, a partner, a sounding board uh, for all of your good ideas that'll help make the experience awesome for the kids. Okay. Um, Father, I only took one breath the whole time I was doing that. Did you notice that? Um, one thing that wasn't clear to me is, should they send in their one and only copy to the Catholic Center um, and not make any other copies of the letters? Um, I didn't. I, didn't I, have to, I have to check my notes. I'll get back to you on that, okay? Great. I'll put, put it in, in the chat. Put it in the chat line, and if you want to, you can use all caps. Okay. Um, <laughs> Christina Tuli is going to speak to us just before we take questions on, on the content and format of the letters. She's going to talk just for a moment about due dates and sending in the letters. I have a feeling this is a little bit of a reiteration of what we've just heard. But while she does that, I'm going to put onto the screen um, the, uh, what you have in your packets on page 21 and 22. Uh, Christina, if you'd like to say a word. Yes, um, I want to reiterate what Ken said about the month before, but what you'll see on these two pages in your package that sometimes it's actually my due date is five months before. And five that what? is to five, get, or, uh, five weeks before, mm -hmm. uh, not five months, um, mm -hmm. because that gives us a little bit of wiggle room. You know, as you'll see during this season, we'll process 1500 to 1700 letters. So I kind of, you know, want to have a little bit of extra wiggle room. Um, and and we know it's not always possible that you're going to get it in by that time, but that gives you something to shoot for. Also, we also are aware that 
you know, you're going to have some kids that just are resistant. And you'll, you, if you have five, uh, 50 kids to be confirmed and you have 45 letters ready and there are five kids dragging their, t uh, their feet, let me know. Um, we may go ahead and say if it's getting close to the due time or overtime, send us those 45, keep bugging those five and get them to us as soon as what you can. Um, because as he said, we're processing a lot of letters in a short amount of time for the Archbishop and with everyone's schedule, including his own, sometimes he's getting three, four sets of letters in a week. Um, so it, so it, there's a big volume. Just a little caveat, when he came and first said he wanted to do these letters, he did not really understand the volume. Uh, he used to confirm a couple hundred kids in Evansville, and it was kind of culture shock when he got here and realized just how many masses and kids he was going to confirm. But I want to thank you all um, for working with this. I know it was it, when he first said he wanted to do these letters, I think everyone was like, what? Is he crazy? Mm -hmm. And But now that we've done them and we've seen the benefit and we see how he connects to the young church through those letters, it, it's really been very edifying to see what, what the results have been. Um, is there any questions about the due dates or anything? And we can take questions now on both uh, letters, due, date, due dates, um, sending in the letters, content and format, anything, or if anyone wants to share a best practice of something that's worked for you, um, uh, we'd be grateful to hear that. Uh, is there anybody who would like to share or comment or ask a question? Yes, Anne, please. Um, I just want to clarify. So you want two versions. You want a PDF version and a copy original version. You want them both. Yes, that's okay. new this year. That is okay. new. And, and one of the reasons why we're asking for that is because mm -hmm. In the, in the last couple of years with the PDFs, we have had some that have been um, uh, prepared in a light ink or a pencil. And it's been very difficult for the archbishop to read them and for the, the people who are processing the letters to read that. So now we can give him the originals and it's easier for him to read. Okay, okay. Um, I know for Christ the King, we're so close that every year I've just driven down either the original to you and I've kept a copy, but you want me to start also submitting in PDF. That would be helpful. That way okay. we have a record that, yes, we have received them. Okay. All right. Thank you. When it comes to something that the Archbishop requests, we'd love to have a, a backup and a backup to the backup. Uh, just so that we don't disrupt the flow of his ministry. So okay. thanks for that extra step, everybody. S super quick, we've got a team of over a dozen people who are processing these letters, most of whom are in the building, some of whom aren't. So having them, they're going to get put into a PDF probably anyway, because that's one way that we distribute the letters to folks who are helping to prepare the binders. So, so um, it, it's kind of a win-win uh, situation. Uh, yes, Sister Sister Marianne. Hi, I don't have a question really, but I have to tell you, I, I'm. this is my second year as youth minister as well as DRE in the parish. And I came from Chicago where it was a zillion kids and a zillion parishes. So when I came here and started going to confirmation with our previous youth minister, this was the thing that was most touching to me. And I, and I just feel... It's touching to me. It's I love watching the parents' faces. I love watching the kids' faces. And when I'm now, when I'm teaching the kids, and we're talking about it, they you can really well. I'm I'm preaching to the choir. I realize, but they get kind of impressed with this. And I kind of did a little white fib because I said, you know, the only ones reading this. Of course, I knew there's a whole bunch of you down there looking and processing these, but. I said, really, it's between you and the Archbishop. I just get to read them, which is a huge honor for me. As a matter of fact, one letter just was so touching to me that when I was leading our, our uh, 
our weekly communion service, I used it as the basis for the homily and the people there were just, I mean, I said, this, this kid gets it and she's a teenager, this kid gets it. So anyway, thanks for the chance to kind of, I mean, you don't need me to tell you that it's a wonderful thing, but it's my favorite thing from the whole process that I just love. Yes, it's a big pain to get some of them to get those darn letters emailed to me, but it's worth every minute of aggravation. Thank you. If it's a struggle for any of you, uh, just think of the graces that you're receiving and chasing them down. Grace <laughs> upon grace. Um, and um, any other comments or questions regarding content, format, due dates? Many, many thanks for your attentiveness to, to all aspects of that. Let's talk next about the uh, gathering that the Archbishop has with the candidates prior to the celebration of confirmation. Uh, also, this is in your packet on page six, if you would like a, um, a, a more complete uh, description of, of this at uh, this time. Christina? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and along with the letters, he does like to meet with all of the candidates and their sponsors uh, about an hour prior to the mass. At the cathedral, it's at six o'clock. We are back to meeting in the assembly hall of the Catholic Center. I encourage everyone to have their candidates there by 545. Sometimes he walks down early. If they're there by 545, they have time to pick up name tags, any gifts or tokens. They have time to go to the restroom because when he walks in, he's ready. And it's good if everyone is sitting down and they're in their seats and ready to go. Um, in the deaneries, make sure you are in a space where everybody can sit comfortably. And um, I, I know there was one case in a parish where they were in a little music room and they were on top of each other. You'll also need to make sure if you're at one of the parish locations that where he is meeting the candidates especially if it's a large group, but have a sound system and a microphone ready. So he's not shouting. Uh, he does a lot of talking. He also wants to be able to walk in between and kind of now that we're out of the COVID stuff and he'll get closer to the candidates. Sometimes he'll, if they're answering a question, he'll put the microphone so in front of them so everyone can hear. So that's always good if you know that he, ahead of time that he may be doing that. Um, again, I, like I said, it, at, the la at the least have them there an hour ahead of time. If you can get them there sooner, that's better. Parents should go, if, they, if you're meeting in a location other than the church, parents need to just go on and, and find their way to the church. Or if they're meeting in the church, just have them remain outside so um, he can have that personal time with the candidates and the sponsors. Um, yeah, it's just all about being comfortable and making sure that he has what he needs. If you have a, a wireless microphone, have backup batteries. That has happened at the Catholic Center before. And when the microphone has gone off, all he does is stick his hand out and hand it to me. Um, and at the Catholic Center, there will always be a staff person there as a host. We, sometimes it's me, sometimes it will be someone else. We'll be there to greet people, um, point out where the name tags are, make sure that they know where the restrooms are. In a deanery uh, location or parish location, I would suggest doing the same thing, having someone either on staff or a parent who is the point person who can make sure the lights are on, the sound system is working, uh, make sure that he has the microphone when he gets there, that he's not looking for it. Um, uh, and then at the end of the meeting, and, and I will tell you, sometimes he's really chatty. And if mass starts at seven, it might be 6.50 before he's done. So you need to be prepared to give any instructions to your kids about, you know, how they're going to line up, get them lined up and get them across or wherever they're going as, as soon as what you can. You know, they're not going to start mass without you, but you don't want to delay any more than is necessary. At the Catholic Center, we will, we cross Meridian Street. We do have traffic assistance that will stop traffic and 
uh, the candidates and the sponsors will be lined up by parish. They do not have to be in alphabetical order at any time. And the traffic officer will get them across the street and there'll be hospitality people who will greet them at the cathedral and guide them to reserve seats and get them seated. I would encourage that to happen in a parish church also to have a couple of hospitality people standing there waiting for them, handing them a worship aid so they can participate and getting them to their seats as quickly as possible. Any questions? Questions or comments? Um, as as you've noted in some of our comments, we um, we basically have kind of two scenarios in our confirmation guidelines. All of those confirmations that take place at the cathedral, which are mostly parishes from the Indianapolis deaneries, mm -hmm. not all of them, but most of them. And then at any parish church outside of the cathedral, we often try to tailor our comments in those two different venues because we have a standard way we do them do the confirmations at the cathedral uh, and we try and uh, give instruction for how it could be done locally at a parish either at a deanery celebration or for that parish itself or that parish and another who are gathered together so you'll see in the in the in the guidelines those two distinctions whether the it's at the cathedral or whether it's at a parish other than the cathedral uh, we're still streamlining that a bit we used to have two different documents um, uh, for, for these two scenarios. We decided we would bring it all together in, into one document. We hope that's not too confusing. If it is, let us know and we'll we'll work it out. But you'll see those designations uh, in the in the programs or in the in the uh, uh, in the document we sent you. Ann Collins, please. Hi. This is I know this is going to be a really hard request, and it is hard to do this here at our own church as well. Um, because we have such limited time to cross Meridian and get the candidates and their sponsors in the seats reverently, um, I wonder if there is any way that while the parents and grandparents and whoever is coming to be part of the congregation um, can be expected to be seated and praying or be reverent so that they are not in the aisles when we're walking in. Um, and I know that's hard because I know parents are very chatty and nothing um, from the mass standpoint is going on. But I have noticed the past couple of years as we walk our candidates in down the aisles, you know, a mom might grab their child and say, give grandma a hug real quick. You know, she wants to see you or they try and stop them to pose for a picture. And if we can get the parents in the seats and say, this is a time for prayer, there's no talking or something, then the candidates can get to their seats more quickly. The priests can go get vested more quickly. Um, and I know that's super hard here when we do our first communion. I've watched our priests flash lights off and on, go up to the ambo and say, can everybody please sit down multiple times. Um, but just the thing, if they're not gathering in the aisles and talking and grabbing the candidates, um, it can help. So, but I know excellent. they're excited and it's a celebration and I get it, but. Good thing, yeah. And that's an excellent yeah. comment. And I do believe there's probably a protocol we could put in place to make an attempt to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps between Christina and Andy and I working with the MC of the mass, um, we could perhaps 10 minutes before seven indicate that all need to be in their seats at this time. Mm -hmm. and, and those that don't will be fined and we'll pass a collection basket. <laughs> and I can also, um, with my hospitality ministers, my hospitality coordinator, that could be something that they could have their volunteer hospitality people go amongst the people and say, okay, it's time to find your seat and they're getting ready to come over and we need to clear the aisles and let them get into their places without interruption. Yeah, we can definitely, that's, that's great. I had no idea that was happening, Anne, because I'm not usually at the church. I'm usually at the Catholic center, so. Okay. The other thing, the other thing we could say is that anyone who's not seated by a certain time will have to sit in the front row. Oh yeah, uh -huh. and that that might that might do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other uh, comments or questions from the group about the gathering beforehand?
Very good. Okay. We're going to get into some meat and potatoes of the document now. And um, uh, this is going to be particularly related to the liturgical guidelines. And I'm going to ask Andy Motika of our office to speak first with regard to liturgical music. And um, Andy, if you could um, make reference, of course, to uh, the part of the packet related, chapter three, related to liturgical music as you're speaking, I'd be grateful. Christina, I'll have you speak next um, about um, the uh, the other considerations uh, for um, with regard to the liturgy uh, on pages seven and eight of the, seven, eight, and nine of the packet. Andy, if you take a moment, please. Thanks, Father Pat. Um, I actually, I can hopefully refer to something that was a concern of Anne's uh, while we while we walk through this as well. Um, generally speaking, uh, music at the confirmation masses is the responsibility or the uh, privilege of the parishes that are celebrating uh, those masses. Uh, when they are in the parishes, of course, um, it's as simple as uh, your parish musician choir director, cantors, those things can be involved uh, to whatever degree uh, you decide at the parish level. At the cathedral, uh, we welcome outside musicians to come in and to uh, lead uh, music for the mass. Uh, oftentimes when they are collaborative confirmations between multiple parishes, usually those parishes will determine one parish to spearhead those celebrations and so this year this parish may be in charge of it and if you're together next year maybe one of the other parishes is in charge of putting things together um and that's fine with us either way as long as we're working together on uh, on getting it all together in addition some parishes don't feel comfortable uh leading that they don't feel that they have a strong enough musician to lead the music or they're scheduled in such a way that they can't do that um, the uh, uh, if in those situations, let us know at the office of worship, uh, you know, a month or so ahead of time, at least, and we can coordinate to have a musician and a cantor there to help lead uh, music for the mass. Uh, either myself, uh, either I will play it myself, or we have uh, a few other uh, excellent musicians from the area that are uh, helping out and are kind of part of a small team we've put together to make sure we have these things covered. Um, as Christina said earlier, as long as we have your information, at least, what did we say, three, three weeks, four weeks ahead of time? Four, yeah. Um, we can help put all these things in the worship aid. Most of the time, music that people request or have planned for their uh, liturgies uh, is very accessible to us. We can find it. We can put it right in the worship aid ourselves. Once in a while, we'll need you to, to scan something or give us some more information uh, for, for how to uh, get the particular music uh, that you need. Um, so to get a little bit into the nuts and bolts, um, we are you know, always using music that is appropriate for themes like the Holy Spirit, baptism, the Eucharist, uh, all of those kinds of, of uh, uh, themes are good, especially things that the people of your parish know and can participate well in. Um, we're not, we uh, are not setting anything for any parishes at this time, um, other than choose hymns, songs, and a mass ordinary, the, the main mass parts that people know and can join in with um, on their own. Um, the only exception to that is, are, are two uh, things that are proper, namely uh, the responsorial psalm and the, the uh, gospel acclamation verse. Um, we're uh, asking that people use Psalm 104, uh, uh, Lord, uh, send out your spirit, which is the same Psalm for Pentecost, as well as the uh, verse uh, that accompanies the Pentecost uh, gospel acclamation. Um, the only exception to that is if your confirmation mass falls on a solemnity in which we have to change the readings and that they're different for those days, we will use the readings of the day. So we use the Psalm and, and gospel acclamation verse of the day rather than um, of the confirmation mass. Um, 
So, uh, Anne, one solution actually that, that stuck out to me when you uh, asked about getting everyone in their seats and getting, uh, this is a great time for your musicians to maybe have a little bit of prelude music and to get everyone in their seats to kind of set the tone a little bit. So in my experience, it's, it's hit or miss. Sometimes when the musicians or a pianist or an organist start playing, um, everyone settles down. It puts everyone in a, a nice prayerful mood and they return to their seat. And that's, that's great. That's exactly what we want. And every once in a while, everyone just starts talking louder instead. So we kind of have to take that into consideration. Uh, Christina, did you have yes. a question first? Yes, Andy, speaking of the Psalm, yep. many of the deanery confirmations are falling on Sundays. Like yes. uh, some of them are, are during Lent, and, but most of them that mm. fall on a Sunday will be in the Easter season. Should they still use Psalm 104 or should they use Psalm, the Psalm relating to the day? That's a good question. Uh, Sundays follow all of the same uh, rules as solemnities. So if they're using the readings of the day, if they're using the readings of Sunday, then we should also use the Psalm and gospel acclamation verse of Sunday. Yes, that's a, that's a good question. Um, uh, there is a Gloria at every Confirmation Mass, whether it is on a Sunday, whether it is on a weekday, even if it's on a weekday in Lent, there is a Gloria sung at all Confirmation Masses, so, so be ready with that. Um, other than that, most of this is going to be pretty standard fare for your musicians as far as preparing Masses. Um, the only thing that's a little different is there will be some music that is needed uh, during the anointing. So when the candidates for confirmation are coming up to the archbishop to be anointed uh, with chrism, uh, we usually fill with music. And there's a lot of flexibility, if you see in your packet on page 10, um, there's a lot of flexibility for what you can do at that time. You can do, you know, a simple responsorial piece of music. You can do something that's a solo from an or an instrumental. You can do something from a choir or a small ensemble. There's a lot of flexibility. Um, and if you're trying to plan it, if you're trying to think how much music will I need to cover this, consider that it takes about 10 seconds per candidate uh, to get through the line. So if you have 60 candidates, that's going to be about 10 minutes of music. 10, no, 600 seconds. So five minutes of music. Yeah. Um, so that's a, a pretty good guideline for, for timing it out and, and knowing what you need. Did I see a hand raised? Maybe I didn't. Okay. Um, as far as the musicians you are bringing to the masses, um, you're encouraged to bring as, uh, as many or as few musicians as you like, uh, as long as you communicate those to us. Um, I know we said earlier that COVID changed everything, but mercifully, this is one way we're trying to return to something that resembles normal, is we're trying to uh, allow uh, people to bring their own musicians uh, which is always a good uh, welcoming thing, especially at the cathedral, but also at all of the, the local parishes. Um, but again, if you need any assistance, please let us know. We, we can get it covered. So don't feel like you're, you're out in the cold if you, uh, if you don't have the ability to do that. Um, if you are at the cathedral, uh, listed on page 11 is uh, a list of the musical resources that we have from the instruments that you have access to, um, to the kinds of microphones and sound equipment that we have uh, that we can help set you up with. Again, even if you're bringing your own group, we will have someone there, whether it's myself or one of our other team members, will help set up microphones and any other kinds of amplification if you need it. Um, and if you are a, a pianist or an organist and would like some time uh, on the cathedral instruments to practice before the confirmation, um, just let me know, contact me directly and we can set you up with uh, a time to, to get in. Uh, Sister Marianne. I'm sorry, this might not be in your in your area, but I was afraid I'd forget it. When you mentioned COVID and being able to have musicians there, will there be live streaming continuing this year as we did last year? Do you know? We were not planning on offering it because we have the ability to have a bigger capacity in the church now. Okay. So we were we were anticipating going back to um, to kind of a uh, a more pre-pandemic mode of of hosting, especially at the cathedral. 
if someone, if a parish has a particular need or a specific request, knowing that we're kind of a small operation there at the cathedral, um, if, if it's something you'd like uh, to make the request for, please reach out to the office and we'll see if we can arrange it. Okay, thank you. Um, I just uh, know some people aren't, still aren't coming out, yeah. and, you know. If and there's plus a, we have sponsors in Africa too, so it's Yeah, kind of a, so if there's a special consideration, uh, we will uh, we'll deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis, but we're encouraging those who maybe normally wouldn't have been able to be with us before the pandemic to come and, and be with us in, in person now. Okay, thank it's you. a it's a tightrope uh, with live streaming, isn't it? You uh, you want to make uh, those who are really truly unable to be there have the connection, but you also want to give the encouragement for in person worship, which is so critical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that question. Um, one more thing to note, as far as uh, bringing uh, musical forces to the cathedral or to the other parish uh, confirmation masses, is while we are encouraging people to bring their own musical ensembles, choirs, and, and other groups uh, to come and uh, lead music for these events, uh, the only thing that is required that we must have for the Mass is at least an accompanist and a cantor. As long as we have at least a cantor and an accompanist, we should be enough to get through. We need someone to lead song. Um, but don't feel like um, you have to bring a 50-voice choir um, just because it's uh, something that you may have done in the past or something that you, you think may be the, the perfect vision. It's better to do something small and well than to try and overdo it and, and have it uh, be something of a mess. So, um, and, with, and with all the liturgical considerations, mm -hmm. we, we want to really strive to do what the church asks and to do it the best we can. So we wanna celebrate the liturgy well and we want to facilitate the, the full and conscious and active participation of all the people. So to model that for the young church and to engage the young, young church in that at this, at this significant ceremony lends itself to giving it maybe a little extra attention um, so that as they celebrate with the archbishop, uh, this liminal uh, and, and important moment in their initiation uh, that we are really, really praying uh, with the fullness and the richness of what the church offers us. And there will be a little bit of time, uh, at least at the cathedral, for um, musicians to do a little bit of a warm up, uh, sound check, those kind of things, especially since we have now returned to having uh, the Archbishop meet with the candidates uh, across the street at the Catholic Center. There's more time and space uh, in the church uh, to warm up with that. I usually encourage musicians to be there pretty early, uh, maybe even as early as 530 for a seven o'clock confirmation. So that way, if they have any warming up or practicing to do, they can be done and all wrapped up by 6.30 and can kind of be quiet to let everyone settle down for the for the mass. Christina? Um, Andy, just uh, I just wanted to make sure everyone understood, you will have a music coordinator to help the musicians at every mass at the cathedral. And and that might not be a bad idea if if at a host parish, musicians from another parish are coming in mm -hmm. it would be good if there is a musician or someone at the parish to make sure that they have what they need yeah that's a great point and i i i'm happy that you uh reiterated yes just as i said that we are we're willing to to help out and and uh take the lead if it's necessary at the at the cathedral um we are uh no matter what even if a group is bringing their own musicians and singers there will be a point person at the church to help to set up and get everything ready and make sure everything is functioning uh, properly. Um, and uh, that would be wise at the other churches too, to make sure we have one coordinator that can, that can be the, the person to talk to in those situations. I'd like to invite um, uh, just a, a final check to see if there's any questions about liturgical music uh, or sung prayer during the celebration of confirmation. I'd like to ask Christina if she would, uh, looking kind of toward page seven and pages seven and eight in your packet, uh, just to briefly touch base on some of these general liturgical considerations. Um, you'll note we just have a lot of stuff in this packet, and so much of it is what we have learned over the years from trial and error and from frequently asked questions and from particular preferences that the Archbishop has and, and reiterations that, that we know 
we need to make uh, so that we shoot that arrow in the direction of, of what the church asks. So these are some general things, um, beginning with name tags for candidates on page seven, Christina. Yes, name tags for candidates. We What is required on the name tag is their saint's name that is printed clearly, um, preferably in a larger font. The ideal is that when the sponsor says the saint name, the archbishop understands and hears, but sometimes that doesn't always happen. So it's helpful if he can clearly read the name tag that is on the candidate. Um, I suggest and prefer, and he prefers that the candidates receive their name tags before he even meets with them, because usually time at the end of his gathering with them is very short. So in your gathering space, make sure that there's a table where the name tags can be laid out. Um, going into photography, we don't want to prohibit family members and grandma and grandpa from taking pictures, but it needs to be not intrusive, not standing in the aisles, um, no flash photography. Many parish clusters or parishes will hire a videographer or a photographer. At the cathedral, we have designated places where they can stand. If that's gonna be the case in a deanery location, we also suggest that you have a dedicated place for the videographer or the photographer to stand to take pictures. Um, special needs, accessibility, gluten intolerance, that's pretty well explanatory. You know, if you, if you know that you have someone with special needs, for instance, who cannot walk up the steps for the uh, sponsor can't walk up the steps. If we know that ahead of time, the Archbishop's more than happy to come down and anoint the candidate uh, at, at the, at, on the main floor. Um, gluten intolerance, again, if we know that ahead of time, or even that day, if you know someone needs a low gluten host, just make sure that the MC is aware of that. Each parish should make sure that there are few low gluten hosts available for that mass just in case. And the MC will have an opportunity to um, get that prepared and he'll make a plan on how to distribute to those who need the low gluten host. Uh, again, I'm talking about wheelchairs. I, I wanna make a comment about the master of ceremonies. The most of you, many of you have worked with Mr. Laurel Tansy. And I wanted to let you know he is retired. So there are two other MCs that will be covering confirmations and we are working on another. So, but they're all very competent. So don't panic if you don't see Mr. Tansy at the confirmations. Can, um, I, add a, can I add a comment sure. to that? Yes. I'm, um, I'm presently kind of uh, reaching out to some people in the diocese who may have knowledge of an individual or individuals who has some familiarity with serving in the sanctuary, assisting at mass in their own parish, and who might be interested in doing this part time. It's a stipend. We have a stipend available for, for these and there's a training and um, you know of any candidates that might make good MCs, I'd be happy to uh, to receive those names uh, for consideration. Thank you. Okay, going on to preparing a worship aid in a, at a parish church, worship aids are preferred, but if you have enough hymnals that everyone can use a hymnal and participate, that is okay to use a hymnal, but it's nice to have a worship aid. It just kind of elevates the celebration a little bit. At the cathedral, if you're lucky enough to come to the cathedral, that means that the Office of Worship, meaning me and Andy, we prepare the worship aid for you. That was something that we decided to do a few years back because so many of the parishes struggle um, at that time in, in coming up with a worship aid that was easily readable. So that's part of our ministry in the Office of Worship is to prepare the worship aids for those celebrating at the cathedral. And we certainly could provide a template to those in, yes. in parishes other than the cathedral if you'd like to use ours. Yes. If you ever need a template, all you have to do is email me and I'll be happy to send one to you. If, for the cathedral masses, we will need the music selections and composers at least 
three weeks, if not four weeks ahead of the mass. Uh, as you'll see when we get into the schedule, there are times I'm doing three and four worship aids a week. So the earlier I get the information, the earlier Andy and I can get things together. We try and have a formula for how many worship aids to print. Now that we're getting back into where more people are able to come to these celebrations, my formula has been five worship aids for each candidate. So, you know, like if you've got 60 candidates, multiply it by five. And that's usually enough. Always make sure when you do have a worship aid that there are some left in the sacristy for the archbishop, the celebrating priest, um, et cetera. So they have access to a worship aid. For those of you who are celebrating masses bilingually, we do have the readings, the prayers of the faithful available and in Spanish. Um, we suggest that like the first reading be in English, if the Psalm is gonna be in English, or if the first reading is gonna be in Spanish, the Psalm be in Spanish or be bilingual. Uh, if, you, that is, if that is the case, and I do know who is bilingual, I'll be happy to send that. We also have what is called a bilingual, bilingual order of service. And that walks through the different parts of the mass. And we like the parishes who are doing bilingual masses to fill that out. We give that to the archbishop. So he knows if you prefer, if you would like for him to greet everyone in Spanish, in English or bilingually, then he also knows what readings are in Spanish, what are in English. It kind of gives him a, an opportunity to know, okay, I, I need to have my Spanish missile and be prepared to do some things bilingually. Um, any questions before I keep going? Okay. Um, a contact sheet that you'll see that back when we get into the forms. That is just a sheet, especially if it's a cluster of parishes. Who is my overall contact person for that particular mass? That's the person that I am going to start bugging when I don't get the planning forms in a timely manner. So that's very important to have that ahead of time. And then also for the music, um, that way, if we know who's planning the music, or if it's at the cathedral, you know, who, again, Andy needs to start bugging if we don't have the music in a timely manner. So the sooner I get that form back from parishes, the better for us. It also indicates to us when it's a parish cluster that you all have been communicating together and have been planning this as a group. So there, it's kind of, you know, and so if I don't get it in a timely manner, I may reach out to the parish clusters and say, hey, have you had a chance to meet? Uh, is there anything I can do to facilitate that meeting? And so you can get this worked out. Okay, any more questions? There's lots of stuff coming up on the, the chat. Let's see. And look in page nine now, we've gone through seven and eight. We're moving on to liturgical details. Reserve seats, all candidates and sponsors should have a reserve seat. So it's all designated before they even get to the church. They do not have to be in alphabetical order anymore since their names are not being called individually. So you don't have to worry about that. Just make sure that you have an adequate number of seats. Hey, Christina, I'll take it after the reserve seats. Let's just okay. pause there, pause there and see if there's Sure. Are any of those general liturgical considerations, are there any uh, any questions or comments? I see in the chat line, people are asking with regard to the name, the name tags, do they need to put the word saint in front of the saint's name or just list the name? They do not, just the name. So you do not need to indicate it's a saint. It does need to be a saint, a canonized saint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. on, page, on page four, there's a good paragraph about um, about choosing um, a, a confirmation name, if you want to have some verbiage of how you talk that through with your your young people, mm -hmm. uh, re remember as you'll see there in that that um, those who have been named blessed uh, are not yet eligible to be chosen for a confirmation name. We get some interesting uh, inquiries about saints' names um, because our our young people uh, do some pretty serious research into the communion of saints and find some uh, some pretty interesting uh, patrons. 
but uh, but yes, please uh, uh, please do uh, uh, encourage them uh, in in the way that's described on page four. Um, is it possible to email a spreadsheet of contact information so we can coordinate with our paired parishes? So uh, it seems as though when a parish is paired with another, uh, having good contact information for the parishes to communicate between themselves, what's the best way that we ha handle that or have handled that in the past? Father Pat, uh, in previous years, and what I will do again this year, you'll see on um, pages 21 and 22, the schedule that lists the dates and the parish clusters. I send out an individual email to each parish cluster saying, for and all of the coordinators where it, my email will say the parishes of such and such such and such such and such will be celebrating confirmation on such and such date that way they'll all three have their confirmation email coordinator emails okay um, so that, yeah. on, on the email that comes from you yes yes, yes. Mm -hmm. very good any other questions about these uh, general liturgical considerations great there's a question about blesseds are not eligible, correct? Correct. At this time, blesseds, blesseds are not, not yet eligible for uh, to be chosen as a, as a saint name. And the same would be true in, in our devotion to the blesseds in, in churches. It's not yet um, appropriate to actually place the image or statue of a blessed in church. Uh, we wait until they've, they've arrived at the... Uh, at the level of, of being canonized. If it's an obscure name, uh, we had a, a recent inquiry from someone who chose a, a saint from Iceland. Um, hmm. Sometimes it's not help, it's helpful uh, for there to be a, a good pronunciation guide underneath the name uh, in, in parentheses if it's really obscure and, and, and very unfamiliar. Okay, very good. I want to just um, encourage us to take a quick peek at, uh, at what you'll see really on the rest of page 9, 10, and 11. Oh, excuse me, 9, and then we'll skip over to, to chapter 4 on page 12, um, 13, and, and, uh, and 14. Um, this is just some general liturgical considerations. Uh, what you see on, um, on the top of page 9 there, items needed for... Uh, the liturgical celebration at a parish church other than the cathedral are just some the general information of what we would need to celebrate uh, 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 the, 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 the sacrament of confirmation. You'll note that the MC usually brings the, the, the sacred chrism that is needed uh, for, the, uh, for the, the event. So it isn't, we're not using up the, too much of the, the parish's stock for that. Uh, but there may be a, there may be a, a, a a use of that if it's needed and there's plenty there. Um, Christina, I noticed on the, the list of items needed for the liturgy that um, there was a indication that the Archbishop preferred to have a bowl of warm soapy water. Did we move away from the use of lemon juice or did that not just make it on the list? And you're, and you're muted now. Yes, he did move away from the lemon juice. Uh, he just said soap, soap and water would be fine. Great. So that's just kind of a general, that's just a general list of some things that you, you'd have on hand for, for, uh, uh, for the celebration of this liturgy. The MC will be the one to help verify and confirm all of the things when he arrives, uh, just that, that are in place. But these are some of the things in place. You'll see there uh, the indication of, for instance, the, the, the small decanter of wine. Um, that that's kind of connected a little bit to our, our ongoing precautions during the during the uh, pandemic. We're not yet distributing in this archdiocese the precious blood. Uh, so the only wine that's needed uh, is for the archbishop and for the concelebrants um, uh, for for at the altar. That that could indeed be brought up in the in the gifts procession if there is one, and if you're doing that at your church. But it's there just. Uh, uh, just as a uh, as a reminder, you'll see there at the bottom of page nine uh, an indication about the selection of the standard set of readings that will be used for this year, and a copy of those those readings are 
are also listed particularly for practicing later in the document on uh, pages 18 and 19. Uh, those, uh, those are uh, on a rotation and we select those for the Archbishop and those rotate every three years. Um, as Andy mentioned during his discussion about the liturgical music, um, when the, 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 the feast or the solemnity calls for it, sometimes we have to move away from celebrating the ritual mass of confirmation and celebrate the feast or solemnity with the rite of confirmation in it, which means we use the readings and prayers often for that special feast when called for. And we will help uh, you know that when, uh, when that applies to your celebration, we'll send you an indication of that. Moving to uh, pages Pat, 12. Pat. Yes, Pat, please. Pat, I'm sorry. Um, going back to the liturgical items needed, I just had a thought. For the concelebrants, are we still having them use individual cups to receive the Eucharist? That's or right. To receive the precious blood. So the okay. MC the MC will help them um, navigate that. Okay, so, so they may want to have cups available. Extra cups. Um, the MC uh, will help determine whether or not the concelebrating priest will either receive by intinction from a separate chalice, or will consume the precious blood from a, a, a separate chalice. Okay. As most of you know, that a priest, when celebrating mass, it's required that the priest receive both the body and the blood uh, during during that celebration for it to be a valid uh, concelebration. So that's why that can, that uh, that accommodation needs to be made. And talking about the selection of the readings and the color of the vester, when I send my email out to the individual parishes that are celebrating confirmation, I will include in that email if you're using the standard readings or if they're special readings and what color the vestments will be. So that's in your email um, when I send out the planning materials. Moving to pages 12 and 13, and then a little bit on over into 14, is all about the liturgical ministers. And um, this is about the selection of those who will assist with the celebration and need to be chosen in advance and, and communicated to Christina in, 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 in the forms that she's provided. Um, you'll note, uh, I won't read all of this to you. It's, we've tried to make it as clear and concise as possible. There's indication there about the servers for this mass. Uh, five are needed, more are not necessary. Um, uh, electors are indicated there. One lector may proclaim both readings or there may be two that are chosen. Um, uh, there are indications there uh, on what to do if the lector is a candidate or not. Um, the gospel will be proclaimed by a deacon if he is present or by a concelebration if, if not. The prayer of the faithful is indicated there. The, the proper, it's the proper role of the deacon to offer the prayer of the faith, faithful if he's present. Uh, if, if a deacon is not present, then others may, one or more may, may assist with the offering of the prayer of the faithful. The indication about gift bearers are there. And ministers of hospitality are so critical for this event uh, because of, of the need for uh, moving the candidates both for the anointing as well as the regular communion procession and assisting with with folks at the beginning and 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 our gathering. So you'll see there that at the cathedral, those those confirmations at the cathedral, we've identified we really need six individuals who are adults or mature young people um, who uh, who can assist us with that. And for our bilingual uh, celebrations, it's so helpful to have uh, some who assist who are able to to speak the language of of those present. Uh, for bilingual, it's usually English and Spanish. So Having, having both is really, really helpful. And then this is not as much an issue presently as we're not offering the precious blood, but there are times when we need the assistance of extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. And for those at the cathedral, uh, the, the master of Cer ceremonies will work with them prior uh, and, uh, and help with their training. Just note that there's some information there regarding um, and celebrants. Make sure that you've invited your pastor, associate pastor, senior priest, priest connected to the community. Please make sure that you've extended the invitation. We don't do that. We rely on you to, to make sure you're communicating with them and what they should do, where they're, where they're going to be vesting and that they need to be there. If 
about 15 minutes beforehand and that they're bringing an alb and and a chasuble and stole of the, the appropriate color for the day and you may have that uh, and they may not so please share that with them once you've received that email from christina there's some great information here about deacons and this is this is a little bit of overkill um, but again we've just learned over the years that our, our deacons have appreciated having the the specificity that we've given um, so uh, some general information about deacons uh, one or two may serve and we indicate how that can be broken down and what their role or their role is during this Episcopal liturgy uh, if they are uh, present and able to, to serve. The important role of the parish life coordinators at parishes is acknowledged here and uh, how they may be included and and recognized for their their pastoral leadership in this celebration. And then um, going over, I'm, I'm about on, I'm on page, um, the bottom of page 13 and, and 14, just there's some general sort of descriptions about each of these to guide your selection and, and, and appointment of these positions. Okay. So um, you'll see here that, um, that we have, uh, that we have uh, a, a nice order of service there, just as a reminder, particularly for those outside of the, uh, the cathedral, uh, uh, assisting with understanding the flow of the, the service. At the bottom of page 15, you'll see uh, a good description of how candidates are presented during the liturgy, which takes place after the, the gospel has been proclaimed and before the homily. You'll see that um, uh, the first person who's presenting has a, a, a specific text that's used. And if there are multiple parishes present, the succeeding presenters then have a little bit more of an abbreviated text. Just a reminder, uh, because we still have um, some carryover with this a little bit from something that was formerly done. The candidates are presented as a parish group and are not called individually by name. And when their names are called, they all stand and remain standing until all the candidates from all the parishes have been presented. I'm going to stop there and ask if there's any questions about the presentation of candidates, as that's something that very frequently impacts each of you directly. Okay. Again, looking at the the uh the remainder of of the liturgy after the presentation you'll see we get into the rite of communication proper the rite of confirmation proper and this would be something that would be very helpful for your practice with your candidates which i encourage you to do for the liturgy to talk to them uh, archbishop will go over this with them as well in his conversation with them but um really encourage you to walk through what's going to be happening as they walk uh, walk up to him and um, when they renew their baptismal promises really really speaking with a resounding I do uh, what's done during the anointing and the giving of the sign of peace which is also described on page 16. There's some good notes there for the ministers of hospitality for the anointing procession and then the remainder of the liturgy are all just it's all described fairly well there uh on page 17. again we just wanted to have it there if you need it and you'd like to have a little bit more specificity about the liturgy any questions about the liturgy as a whole the calling forward of liturgical ministers and and our needs and requirements of them i see in the in the chat bar that um we have a question about if there are four parishes at the cathedral, each parish will introduce by their parish leader example. Yes, that is correct. Each parish leader will present their own group using the text that's on the bottom of page 15. Choose from among yourselves the first presenter uh, and then utilize the text for the su succeeding presenters at the bottom of page 15. Yes, sister. Masks. People wearing masks. So we are still just using, we're just, um, we're going to just use masks when, uh, masks are always recommended still, 
um, uh, whenever people would like to wear them, we encourage them and that they can be worn. Um, but we're asking that masks definitely be worn when you're having that close contact. So for the anointing and the exchange of sign of peace and okay. for the reception of Holy Communion, at least those who are distributing need to wear a mask for, for that close contact. Okay, thank you. All other times we're just saying that they're encouraged and recommended. Good. Um, and then uh, getting into some of the, the final documents and we're, we're in the home stretch here, folks. So hang in there. You'll see on page 18 and 19, the copy of the standard set of, of readings for the confirmation liturgies for 2022. We have the, the standard set of prayer of the faithful on page 20. Those come straight from the rite of confirmation. I showed you what's in chapter seven earlier on your screens. That's the schedule of uh, and due dates for uh, for the parish clusters and the, 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 the scheduled confirmations for this year. The first list on page 21 are for all those confirmation masses at parish churches other than the cathedral. And then you'll see on 22, those are all the, the liturgies scheduled at the cathedral um, uh, for uh, uh, for this first part of the year. Christina, do you wanna say anything about the schedule or due dates? Okay. Following that, uh, I I've already showed you briefly the uh, the contact sheet for uh, that is so critical that uh, that we'll get from you and that Christina will request. And then um, you'll see uh, in in the final pages um, what we've tried to put together. Hopefully, it's user friendly of a, a of a, a a clear liturgical planning form based on the uh, the things I've just been speaking about uh, previously. Uh, all the, the things related to uh, liturgical ministers and, and those who will be present with us. You'll see again that um, uh, Form uh, B and Form C on pages 24 and 25 are those that are at a parish or deanery, deanery location outside the cathedral. And you'll see on pages 27 and 28 and 29, um, those that are um, confirmations that are at St. Peter and Paul Cathedral themselves. So um, choose the appropriate one for your celebration and use that to fill in and feel free to scan that in and email that back to Christina. We can help with any, uh, any questions or concerns along the way as you get into the meat and potatoes of doing this planning. And uh, one of the best things that you can do for us is if we have it uh, uh, by that due date, we have plenty of time to, to work out kinks if, if something's emerged that's, that's not helpful. Christina, I see you have a hand raised. Oh, yes. I, oh, oh sorry. Hello there, Christina. <laughs> um, I had a question. In years past, we've often had um, like where one candidate from another parish would join in us at our confirmation mass because they couldn't go to theirs for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, so like we would all, someone would just say, I'll present them for that one parish. Is that like how you want it done? So like, say I have the kids from JP2 and then one random kid from Holy Family, then I would just like, I'd represent JP2 and introduce them and then use the shortened one right after that to say for Holy Family. That is exactly nice. that's ex that's okay. exactly correct, and we're grateful for that. The ability for us to offer that space for kids who can't make their own confirmations helpful, and it's a great way to 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 welcome them in. If you could just uh, take care of that, I appreciate it. So that's the way to do it. I just want to make sure because it's I, I, kind I of like, weird. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you see and, like three parishes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's, it's similar. Uh, it's similar to kind of how you might hear things happen at the right of election if you've ever been. So yes, yes use, <laughs> use that long text text for that kind of host parish, and then and then just say, and I present to you the candidates, the the candidates from Holy Family in Oldenburg or whatever it is, and um, and uh, and then and, and then name it, and then and then have that candidate stand, and then. Uh, if there are any others just after that. Christina? Father Christina Pat. Tooley, Christina Tooley, sorry. Yeah, Father Pat, that used to be rare 
Um, in the last couple of years, I can't tell you how many people have had to move around. I am sincerely hoping that that is not the case going into 22, that it becomes less and less more frequent um, because it's, it, it can be, yeah, we have a lot of moving parts with people moving in the last couple of years. When I find out if someone is needing to move, I will tell either the coordinator or the parent to get with the coordinator so that they can make the arrangements between themselves. I kind of stay out of that. Um, so it's really between the two coordinators of the parishes as to how, you know, the communication process. Any other um, comments on the, the liturgical aspects to the celebration, um, things that have gone well, questions or comments, um, anything that you'd have us work on so we could be more clear? Wonderful. I wanna just ask the, um, the team um, who presented today if uh, anything has emerged that you would like to reiterate or say or add to what's uh, what's already uh, what, what's already uh, occurred? Any from our team? Please, Ken. Super quick. Um, so it's important. Um, it's important that someone at the parish read read the kid the, the candidates' letters before they get sent in. Um, you know, kids, kids will disclose all kinds of things in, in these letters. Um, and when a kid, when a kid discloses something that, that would cause a concern, like suicidal thoughts or that sort of thing, um, what we do is, uh, whoever's processing those letters reaches out to the parish leader, uh, to confirm that the, the leader is aware of it and it's providing pastoral care for, 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 for that kid on that issue where it's most appropriate. And then we put a note on the letter so that Archbishop Thompson knows when he reads the letter that that, that, that is happening. Um, so so if, if you can get out in front of that by just putting a note on that letter and saying, you know, we're aware of this and, 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 and we're working with this kid. I'll tell you what, it's not unusual for Archbishop Thompson in those situations to seek that kid out uh, personally and just say, hey, I just want you to know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm praying for you in a special way. Like he, he sometimes will follow up himself uh, when he can. But I think that's an important one to point out. And finally, one red flag that sometimes people don't know is a red flag. If we see that a kid has chosen a parent as a sponsor, um, you know, we kind of do the same thing. We put a note saying that the that the parish leader has been contacted, and then we reach out to you to, to, to handle that situation because. I think most of us are aware that a parent, a parent, a you know, a parent cannot be a confirmation sponsor. That's that's all. Wonderful, wonderful uh, things to reiterate. Well, I, I want to please, Pat, Christina. I just yes, wanted, please. I just, I just like to say thank you to all of the coordinators because I know this is a lot of work. Um, and and we bug you a lot and we send you lots of papers. And the last couple of years, it seemed like every time I turned around, there was something changing and I was sending an email, guess what, this is not happening or this is happening this way. And I just appreciate your patience and your understanding. And, and I just value your work because it's so important. And um, if there's anything we can do to make it easier, we're certainly willing to try. Thanks for the uh, thanks, uh, Deacon John, for the uh, the note in the chat box with regard to if we have an adult who's unable to make the adult confirmation and is able to make the parish confirmation with our youth, we need to note that. I think making sure Christina Tooley is aware of it because we'll put a note on the Archbishop's planning form um, just to alert him to the fact because if somebody who is 65 years old goes comes up to get confirmed in the midst of a bunch of high, junior high or high school students we'd like to give him a heads up about it um but um but it, it's perfectly fine um uh and and happy to to have them be present um the archbishop loves to have him at the adult confirmation when he can so um so we'd be grateful I'm hoping that this format was helpful to everyone. We will make the recorded version of this available to 
you and, and to your colleagues if you need to come back to anything. And um, do know that we're really, really hoping that we can make your jobs as easy as they can be and, uh, and that we're honored to work with you. Let's, uh, let's finish by just uh, offering a glory be. And as we offer this glory be, let's lift up in our prayer um, all of the confirmation, all the candidates for confirmation in the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end, amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you all and please stay safe in this inclement weather and uh, blessings on, on these days in your ministry.